Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll get started in just a few minutes. We'll let a few more people come in and we'll start in just a moment. For the few folks that are coming in, we're just going to wait for a couple more minutes and then we're going to get started. So let's get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthony Markham. I'm a governance fellow at the R Street Institute. And thank you for joining our very last edition of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group meeting for 2020. It's a project by the R Street Institute. Um, to note, in addition to this event today, most of our events are recorded and can be found on our website, ledgebranch.org, as well as on our parent website, rstreet.org. And on the Ledge Branch site as well, I want to mention that um, all, anything concerning Congress, we have a number of scholarly blog posts, articles, essays, um, a compilation of many things that we've found on the internet, all concerning Congress and all about improving and strengthening the first branch of government. Um, so, and today, I think it's fitting, we're happy to have Fergus, Fergus Brodwick to discuss his most recent book on Congress called Congress at War, How Republican Reformers Fought the Civil War, Defied Lincoln, Ended Slavery, and Remade America. Now, Fergus is an author and a historian, a frequent public speaker, speaking at colleges and universities, appearing on radio and television. His articles have appeared in many magazines and newspapers, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, Harper's, Reader's Digest, among many, many others. Fergus, also a journalist, has traveled the world, writing on politics, economic issues, culture, and history. And in addition to the book we're discussing today, Congress at War, I thought I should mention a couple of his other recent books, one called The First Congress, excuse me, which tells the fascinating story of the First Congress and its work in New York in 1789. Um, in addition to that, a book called America's Great Debate, which covers America's westward expansion, slavery, and the compromise of 1850. The book we're talking about today, Congress at War, is a piece I personally enjoyed and I highly recommend, and I think people would enjoy reading and considering. And it tells an important story. It tells about how Congress was vital and contributed to helping win and ultimately end the Civil War. Though when we think about the Civil War and its ultimate resolution, we typically think of the important steps of generals and the soldiers on the field and the Lincoln administration all took um, often usually to the detriment and overlooking Congress's vital contributions during the time. Beyond pressuring Lincoln to prosecute the war more aggressively, the Civil War Congress also instituted a number of reforms in reinventing our nation's financial system, strengthening the military, and laying the seeds for reconstruction in a much stronger central government. Now, before I turn it over to Fergus to give a presentation of his book, um, at the end of Fergus's presentation, we're going to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, and you'll notice at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there should be a button there saying Q&A. At any time during the presentation, feel free to um, submit a question and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. So with that, I'll turn it over to our speaker, Fergus. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I'm in California, so it's still morning actually, but uh, so good afternoon to you. Uh, all the people out there whom I can't see, but uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking about this. Uh, and uh, as, as Anthony uh, 
uh, very very kindly described. Uh, well, let's see. This is this is what the book looks like. You'll see a uh, uh, you'll see a better image of the cover picture in a few minutes. Uh, basically, my aim in in this book was to show in a dramatic way the dynamic role that Congress played in waging the Civil War, and to persuade you. I mean, it, or at least to persuade readers that the political story of the war is as much an epic as what took place between the opposing armies. Uh, this book is not about politics in the abstract, the way a uh, political scientist uh, uh, dealing mainly in metrics uh, would write it, but rather uh, as it was seen by the men who lived it. Uh, let's uh, go to the first uh, image. I'm going to show you a few pictures that are first ones really to create some of the atmosphere of 1861. Uh, let's see, we'll get there. Uh, I hope. Keep going, please. Okay, here we are. You may uh, uh, already realize what this is. It's the firing at Fort Sumter, April 12th, 1861. Basically, the war begins. Uh, Southern states ha have seceded and will continue to secede, uh, and the crisis, the political crisis begins. Next image, please. Uh, uh, the first federal troops arrive to, to defend Washington. Washington was virtually undefended at the beginning of the war. What you see here, incidentally, is the US Capitol in the background. These troops are not attacking the Capitol, they, they are, probably Massachusetts troops who raced to Washington and they're performing maneuvers on a hill near, near the Capitol. Uh, the Federal Army had a, approximately only 16,000 men in it in April of 1861. Most of them were uh, on the Western frontier fighting Indians. Uh, and there was a desperate fear that, the, uh, uh, the, that Washington would fall very quickly to uh, to Confederates coming from Virginia. Let's go to the next image, please. The United States Capitol building in 1861. This happens to be a scene of Lincoln's uh, inauguration, but the point of the picture is really to show you the dome still incomplete. Uh, and it's a per perfect symbol for the, the broken union uh, at this juncture in 1861. Will the capital ever be finished? Will the union ever be restored? Uh, let's go on to the next image. Okay, well, let's stay on this one for a while. This uh, is the floor of Congress. Uh, it's one of the very, very few images uh, in existence that from that era that show Congress in action. Uh, and it's wonderfully animated, obviously. And uh, on the left, you see a... Uh, uh, an orator. Uh, I, I like to imagine it's Thaddeus Stevens, whom I'll talk about it a, a, a bit later, um, in, in full uh, uh, theatrical flourish with his hand in the air and us uh, two gentlemen um, toward the front uh, 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 seeming to leap out of their, away from their desks to, to uh, uh, attack each other and so on. And it really does capture some of the mood, the, the, the intensity uh, of what Congress was like at that time. And if you look in the upper part of the picture, it's kind of fuzzy, I realize, but the galleries are packed. They're packed because uh, people flock to Congress uh, uh, to hear the great orators of the day. It was, an, it was, it was like the, an American equivalent of the Roman Colosseum in a, in a sense. So anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a center of great cultural, not just political intensity. Okay, so virtually no member of Congress arrived in Washington in 1861, anticipating four years of war. And of the two wartime Congresses, that's the 37th and 38th, Albert Riddle, a radical Republican, wrote, Mr. Lincoln, his cabinet, and the Congress were elected to do anything, everything, except what fell to them to do, fight the greatest civil war of history. It came upon them as an utter surprise. Uh, in other words, nobody ex knew what was coming. And once it came, nobody knew the outcome. 
I want to make clear, by the way, that this is not a book about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I, I don't think I, I need to reiterate that there are many, many, many excellent books uh, about his presidency by Harold Holzer, Sidney Blumenthal, David Herbert Donald, Vernon Burton, and many others. What I wanted to do here was to look at the war from an almost completely different and surprisingly ignored perspective, that is, from Capitol Hill. Congress faced a, a multitude of challenges. Uh, whether the North could even be mobilized for a war of unimaginable magnitude. Was Congress or the president responsible for leading the war effort? Could the Republicans, who were completely untried, uh, uh, even manage to govern? Should the war be fought with respect for the sanctity of Southern property, that is, slaves, not only slaves, or with a ruthlessness that would bring the seceded states much more quickly to their knees? Could the Constitution survive the suspension of civil rights in the name of national security? How would the war be paid for? Would its financial burden break the Northern economy? I should say parenthetically that the federal government was virtually bankrupt at the beginning of the war. Um, uh, the challenge was immense to find the money for the war. Uh, what should white Americans do about slavery? Could Republicans prevent their party from splitting between anti-slavery radicals and those generally referred to at the time as moderates uh, uh, who were willing to tolerate slavery as long as it was contained in the South? Bear in mind that the Democratic Party had already split in two. Should African Americans be recruited to serve in the army? Would white soldiers refuse to fight alongside them? After the war was won, assuming that the North triumphed, an arguable proposition for much of the war, should the Southern states be broken up? Should ex-Confederates be prosecuted as war criminals? There was no consensus on any of these questions and many others that I haven't mentioned. Suspicion of central government in general, distrust of a strong executive in particular, and embedded traditions of states' rights in the North as well as in the South threatened to undermine the country's war-making ability. And racism threatened any attempt to emancipate slaves. Many unionists, especially in the border states, regarded any kind of tampering with slavery as a threat to basic property rights. Representative John Crisfield, a pro-slavery unionist from Maryland, declared, I'm quoting, if you take from us today our right to hold slaves, how long will it be before you will take from us some other constitutional right? Uh, I mean, the fate of slavery was, was uh, uh, no, by no means clear. And, and, and uh, uh, the, the anxiety that border states might even break away from the North, border slave states, over the question of slavery hung over Congress for quite some time. With Southerners gone, the Republicans for the first time held decisive majorities in both houses of Congress. By the spring of 1861, a third of the seats in both chambers were empty because they'd been abandoned by the members who had defected to the Confederacy. Uh, <coughs> the Republicans began an era of legislative activism that would change American society beyond recognition. And during the next four years, Congress would, broadly speaking, help win the war, craft the peace, reinvent the nation's financial system, as Anthony pointed out, uh, and enact a raft of forward-looking legislation that had been blocked by Southern intransigence for decades in some cases. And in the course of doing so, Congress also laid the foundation for strong activist central government that fully came into being in the 20th century. That, in turn, permanently altered the relationship between the states and the federal government and, uh, enshrined the production, and enshrined the protection of civil rights as the responsibility of the federal government for the first time in history. Fear of failure, losing the war on the battlefield, financial collapse, weakness in the White House, never abated until late 1864, three and a half years into the war. In Congress, idealism collided with ruthless pragmatism, as perhaps it always does. Uh, 
Some men soared from obscurity to greatness and others who were very famous in their day sank beneath the, the quicksand of the changing political landscape. Uh, the wartime Congresses were incredibly productive. Uh, Ohio Senator John Sherman, the brother of General William Tecumseh Sherman, predicted that the many landmark laws that the Congress has passed will be a monument to good or evil. They cover such vast sums, delegate and regulate such vast powers, and are so far reaching in their effects that generations will be affected well or ill by them. Um, he was right. Congress raised hundreds of thousands of troops for the Union. The Congress instituted the first national draft. It pushed hard against Lincoln for more aggressive generals, harsher strategy against the South, and the recruitment of African Americans. In providing financing for the war, Congress created the country's first national currency, the forerunner of the Internal Revenue Service, and the foundation for the Federal Reserve System. Congress also passed the Homestead Act, the Transcontinental uh, Railway Act, and the Land Grant Colleges Act. These three are not typically uh, uh, described as war measures, but they would not have been passed had it not been for the war. Those were three measures that had been held up for years by intransig intransigent Southerners uh, who did not want Western territories opened uh, 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 unless they um, protected slavery, unless, uh, unless slavery was protected there. Um, also, long before Lincoln became willing to contemplate the emancipation of slaves, members of Congress demanded it, uh, enacting laws that began a racial revolution that uh, overthrew the cotton economy and transformed something like 4 million slaves from property into free men and women, culminating in the 13th Amendment. Uh, as Frederick Douglass said, the angel of liberty has one ear of the nation and the demon of slavery the other. And both those angels whispered and shouted into the ears of Congress as it struggled forward through these years. Less happily, the widespread monitoring of anti-war dissidents mandated by Congress created a precedent for the government's surveillance of private communications, um, the mails, telegraph, and allegedly, and also of allegedly unpatriotic political activity that has become a controversial feature of uh, more recent times. Um, now, in the book, I treat congressional politics as what I like to think of as a dynamic art, full of maneuver for advantage, the endless seeking for compromise, and the, the transmutation of hopes and ideals into policy. And I generally try to keep the story within the historical present. That is, uh, I, I want readers to feel the anxiety and the uncertainty and sometimes the fear and despair, as well as the patriotic fervor and sometimes irrational confidence that characterized almost every stage of the war when no one knew what the outcome would be. Um, uh, well, I, I, uh, I know we don't have an unlimited amount of time, but I'm going to say a word or two about uh, the kind of people who were in Congress at the time. Uh, like every Congress, both houses included the brilliant, the mediocre, and the totally incompetent, uh, all of whom were on, on, on public display. Uh, but the great majority were imbued with a passionate patriotism that was characteristic of a generation mostly born while the Republic's founders still lived, a few during Washington's presidency and many more during Adams's and Jefferson's. Uh, virtually all could remember, and some had even served with, Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, and John C. Calhoun, the last three of them who were dead barely a decade. Most shocker here, were professional politicians and lawyers uh, with a sprinkling of businessmen, farmers, and journalists. They were opinionated, often brilliantly eloquent and very colorfully combative. Uh, James G. Blaine, who some of you may well know, ran uh, later as a candidate for president uh, and was a young, fiery, radical uh, Republican from Maine at the time, wrote, 
there is no place where so little deference is paid to reputation previously acquired or to eminence one outside, no place where so little consideration is shown for the feelings or the failures of beginners as in Congress. What a man gains, he gains by sheer force of his own character. And if he loses and falls back, he must expect no mercy and will receive no sympathy. Uh, and uh, I think for those of us who uh, from time to time may think uh, uh, Congress, uh, members of Congress have been unduly harsh uh, in, in, in our own day, uh, it, it, it was the Wild West in the mid 19th century. And I should say also that, uh, uh, by the way, members of both houses enjoyed none of the resources that congressmen take for granted today. There were no staffs, no private offices, no research facilities, apart from the Library of Congress, which was then on the Capitol's second floor. Um, <clears throat> and despite the Capitol's grandiose interior uh, decor, which you can see in uh, this picture, uh, the atmosphere was democratic and very informal, often very rough in its manners and perfumed, uh, as every observer of the time will tell you, perfumed with the aroma of cigars, whiskey, and the sweltering, and in the sweltering summer, particularly sweating male bodies. Strangers wandered in and out of the chambers and they sprawled at members' unoccupied desks. And I'm, I'm gonna quote one of my favorite uh, comments by, by a tourist, a young tourist from, uh, I think it was uh, somewhere in New England. Finding the coast clear, I gambled up and down from gallery to gallery, sat in Sumner's chair, examined Wilson's books, and pocketed a castaway autograph or two. You know, uh, try that today. Uh, <clears throat> contractors and petitioners flooded the rotunda, uh, plucking, literally plucking at members' sleeves, uh, begging an annuity for some aged relative who was a veteran of the War of 1812 or subsidy for a canal or railway spur or most often a federal job. Um, so, uh, I should tell you also that increasingly during the war, members were speaking not only to their own colleagues, uh, but also to the nation's newspapers, whose reporters were also peering down from that uh, gallery up there, and also to Americans across the nation, which had recently been wired for telegraphy, so that within hours of uh, their delivery speeches uh, traveled to voters all across the country and, and were read aloud in parlors, churches, taverns, street corners. So uh, let's go to the next image, if I may. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the people who were at the center of this story. Uh, pillars, pillars of Congress at the time. I, I've built this, this narrative around, primarily around four men. Three of them were Republicans. Of these, two were outspoken radicals. Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, whom you see here, was uh, one of the fiercest abolitionists in the House, as well as a master of parliamentary strategy and also the de facto majority leader in the House. Uh, this is the classical image of Stevens, a very fierce looking man who was born in 1792. He was one of the oldest members of Congress at the time and one of the most dynamic. And um, Thaddeus Stevens has perhaps suffered more than any other pol Northern political figure of the era uh, by post-war misrepresentation and, and the ascendancy of pro-Southern historians during the long, long, long Jim Crow era. Uh, and is, has, was often written about in, in very, very disparaging terms as vindictive, mean-spirited, uh, um, uh, even mentally unbalanced, and so on. And uh, many of you may have seen the a wonderful but extremely hard to watch uh, film, Birth of a Nation, one of the great American movies, but uh, which, which essentially presents a violently distorted image of Thaddeus Stevens as a as a vindictive and crippled idiot, essentially. Uh, he was crippled, he had a club foot, uh, of which he was not embarrassed at all, by the way. He used it as uh, 
part of his oratorical strategy. And if he had in making a speech, when he was vigor enough, vigorous enough still to get on his feet, he would ostentatiously drag it as he walked across the, uh, the house floor. Uh, and everybody knew that everybody watched Stevens's leg. So Stevens always had eyes on him. Anyway, uh, Stevens, I regard as one of the heroic figures, politically heroic figures, and at the center of practically every major legislative initiative uh, during the wartime. Uh, let's go to the next image. Uh, this is Ben Wade of Ohio uh, from a small town called Jefferson, Ohio in the, in the uh, uh, northeast part of the state. Uh, uh, ben Wade was a driving force in the Senate for a hard war against the Confederacy and he chaired the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, which oversaw the Union war effort. Uh, he's somebody else who suffered greatly uh, by pro, uh, in the books of pro-Southern historians, uh, precisely because he was a radical and, and an abolitionist and uh, um, supported a, a, a hard war policy, which is essentially the fight to beat the Confederacy not fight to a negotiated standstill that would allow slavery to continue. Um, and let's go to the next image. William Pitt Fessenden of Maine, wonderful, wonderful profile here. Uh, Fessenden was a conservative by nature. He's a Republican too, of course, and only cautiously aligned himself with the radicals. Uh, because he was committed to a hard war, to winning the war, but he was um, somewhat ambivalent about, about policies bearing on slavery, confiscation of property, and even more so on radical reconstruction later, later on. Uh, but more than any other man, he was responsible for the legislation that enabled the North to pay for the war as chairman of the uh, Senate Finance Committee. He and Stevens worked uh, jointly together. Uh, let's go to the next image. Now this gentleman is uh, the only Democrat amongst the four I, I, I send here on. This is uh, Ohio Representative Clement Vallandigham from Dayton, uh, who is a Northern Democrat with Southern sympathies, very proud of his Virginia heritage, and he was the leading advocate of a negotiated peace, a copperhead in short. As a uh, spokesman, let's go to the next image and you'll see a copperhead. Uh, yes, a copperhead. Uh, uh, and any Northerner seeing this in Harper's Weekly during the war would assume that one of these heads was Clement Blandingham uh, uh, about to attack the Union with her shield. Uh, a spokesman for the anti-war opposition of Van Landingham's views often came very close to treason, at least in the view of Republicans. And although his racial beliefs in particular are repugnant, he was a bigot. He was a now, now uh, unapologetic uh, uh, bigot. Uh, he nevertheless was one of the most provocative dissenters in American history and a self-described martyr to the administration's determined to squelch views that threatened the Union war effort. Uh, let's go to the next image. Uh, uh, this, this is Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln, as I said, is largely an offstage presence in this book. He's there, but he's offstage mostly. Although the war drove him to govern more by executive order than had any of his predecessors, he depended on the Republicans in Congress, who often led him more than followed him and who vigorously insisted that the power to shape the course of the war lay on Capitol Hill, not in the White House. And the principle of war powers, where did they really lie, was no abstraction. They fought over it for most of four years. And just incidentally, I chose this particular image of Lincoln because it is not the much aged father Abraham of the later part of the war. This picture was taken not long before his nomination as a, a Republican presidential candidate. Uh, no beard, obviously, and a marvelous intensity in, in his eyes. I think it's a remarkable photograph. 
uh, and it, this is Lincoln, who has not yet seen the war. Uh, uh, and I, I think uh, I should try to wrap up since I think we've been uh, going for nearly the amount of time that we planned. But um, uh, let's go to the next image. Uh, th th this is not a, not a great picture, but it's significant. This is the moment of passage of the 13th Amendment, uh, ending slavery. Uh, it was one of the great moments in congressional history and one of those wonderful moments when people, people many, many members uh, just abandoned their, their prejudices and anxieties and they voted for what they knew was the right thing to do. And members wept, members wept. Um, and in a way, it's the cr the crowning the crowning achievement of the of the the thirty eighth Congress, not the only achievement, as I hope I've communicated, but but a uh, a crowning one. Uh, so uh, I, I suspect uh, that that some of you or many of you wonder what my book may have to say about today's Congress or about politics today, and does it say anything? And, uh, this, this is a book of history. It's not, it's not a commentary on today's Congress and it's not a polemic. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, I think truth is often distorted by our desire to enlist the past on behalf of our present concerns by changing moral values and the difficulty of figuring out what our ancestors really meant even when we hear their literal words. Uh, so I'm very, very wary of trying to, trying to draw present day lessons from, uh, directly from history. All the same, perhaps they do, all the same, we tend to do that. We, we try to do that. And I think in some ways, uh, perhaps the, these men do have something to tell us about our, how our government can function in the, at its best in challenging times and how crisis may even make it stronger. Uh, I want to underscore that because uh, I think we're in an era today, call it what you will, gridlock or, or uh, super partisanship, hyper partisanship. Uh, uh, I think it can be argued that we're at a cr critical juncture in terms of Congress's functioning. Anyway, the arguments that were made by the men of the wartime Congress still speak to us. A lot of them are still around. Uh, the racial divide, civil rights, the meaning of the constitution, freedom of speech in wartime, the struggle between Congress and the presidency, war powers, and many other things. And they argued all this uh, with a refreshing bluntness uh, and often, often profoundly. Um, this, was, this was not an era of, of, little, of, of quick sound bites. Uh, 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 members spoke two, three, four hours at a clip without notes, and they wrote their own speeches. Those were the days. Um, and I will say also, this book is tacitly a brief for Congress and for representative government, despite its frustrations and disappointments. It's not something I initially intended, but in this rather strange and disturbing moment that we're in, uh, when, uh, when contempt for Congress has dangerously grown, uh, I, I think it's important to, to remember and to illustrate what Congress was meant to be and how it can function at its best. Uh, I think many of you, or perhaps all of you already know that according to some polls, less than 10% of Americans profess confidence in Congress and almost one third of young Americans say that they don't think it's important to live in a democracy. These are terrifying statistics. And Similarly, disdain for Congress flourishes alongside the idea that the presidency has always been the main engine of government, rather than an office whose power is deliberately circumscribed by the Constitution. 19th century Americans, including those of the Civil War era, believed that the real seat of power lay in Congress. Uh, so, also, to us, Congress may seem needlessly quarrelsome and inefficient. But its workings, I, I think it needs to be reiterated, are just the, really the cacophony of our multitude of American voices distilled to 535 representatives and senator, senators. Senator uh, William Pitt Fessenden, uh, 
the chairman of the Finance Committee, whom I mentioned earlier, understood that Congress was a stew of self-interests seasoned with passions, and that to accomplish anything required creative skill, tolerance, and immense patience. Republican politics is always messy, never not. The founders knew it. They fought a revolution to put competitive politics into government, not to take it out of government. Uh, uh, I mean, there are, there, are, there are many Americans of different political stripes who wish that Congress would just function smoothly like a well-oiled machine. It never has since 1789. Uh, as, as Fessenden put it, I'm going to quote, I'm going to end with this. He said, I would not have perfect quiet always. In a republic, especially, you never find quiet except under a tyranny. And if... Um, and if, if you take nothing away, else away from this talk, try to remember that. And, and uh, that, that uh, we, our, our, our representatives are gonna continue to get out there and fight and argue and batter each other. And that's democracy in action, Republican government in action. Thank you, Anthony. Um, uh, ah, there we are. So I right, think you to talk a bit. Sure. That, well, thank you again for that overview. And I think for the people watching, um, really appreciate it. I think it sends as hesitant to kind of have a comparison to today's Congress and today's political system. I think it does show important political lessons on what an effective Congress can do, not only for checking other powers of our government, but actually being a force for good. And I think those are important lessons and important takeaways from the book. And Fergus, thank you again for your overview of that. Um, I should mention, I mentioned at the beginning, if you have any questions, feel free to um, put them in the Q&A section of the Zoom chat. We have a couple questions already up that we're going to get to both. Um, selfishly, since I'm moderating, I'm going to ask a question myself first, and then we'll get to the, to the others. You know, as was discussed in the book, this was an incredibly productive era. Um, all sorts of legislation, not only concerning the war, but considering the future. You know, we can think of as someone who went to a land grant university, things that affect you today happened during the Civil War Congress. And so, however, because of the succession of Southern states, a number of Democrats leaving Congress to join the Confederacy, the Congress of this time was dominated by one party, was dominated by the Republican Party. To you, does this suggest that Congress can be productive when it's unanimously controlled by one party, or is there still opportunity when you have a multiple party system controlling Congress to still be as productive and be as productive as a force as Congress was during this era? Well, that's really the big question, isn't it? Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough nut. I'll do my best to crack it uh, or put a crack in it, perhaps. Um, uh, the, most, the most productive Congresses in American history have been Congresses that were heavily dominated by one party. That's the first Congress, which I wrote a book about, um, which was fully controlled by people who then or later were identified as Federalists. Uh, the Civil War Congresses, um, the New Deal Congresses in the 1930s, and uh, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society con Congresses. Now, uh, forget the party affiliations, but just the, 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 what they have in common is that one party dominated massively. And in, in all those cases, the, the dominant party did have an agenda. It had a lot that it wanted to do. It wanted to govern. It wanted uh, uh, to make things happen. Now, if, you, if one party philosophically uh, would prefer to govern less, that's another story. Uh, philosophically, that is sometimes the case. We've had eras in American history when uh, uh, we've had a dominant party uh, that uh, uh, preferred small or even weak central government. Okay, uh, but to to come to your bigger question, can it can it can a Congress uh, made up of uh, diverse parties, two at least, um, uh, manage to govern as well and as productively? It's harder. Although even when there were when one party dominated, uh, a, a that party would 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 uh, break tentatively or seriously into faction. 
basically one conservative conservatives, moderates, and maybe uh, radicals or progressives, you know, in some some combination. Every party has, relatively speaking, that kind of composition. Uh, uh, now, I wrote in a little book about the Compromise of 1850, which was a very a time when Congress was very fragmented, actually, uh, and and uh, a minor party, uh, Free Soil Party, actually uh, held the balance of power at times, and. In some ways, that era is more comparable to the present one because there was a great deal of polarization. Uh, and yet, uh, finally, that Congress produced uh, this uh, giant compromise, which was a bunch of, a, a lot of different pieces. Uh, it wasn't just one, one thing, it was many different parts. Uh, what it requires, what it requires is a will to govern is a will to govern, a will to cooperate, a will to compromise. And we, in some eras, that is very hard. We've been in one lately that has been very difficult to achieve that. Uh, I mean, I have, uh, uh, the fact that we can do politics in this country is one of the things that makes this uh, 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 the country that it is. And, it, but it requires, to be effective, it really requires creativity. That's a word that isn't often ap applied to politics, but I think it belongs there. Uh, how do you craft legislation uh, uh, that, that transcends or, uh, or ignores ideology, whatever the ideology may be, that ignore, ignores ideology and, and finds that, uh, that common ground? And I, I, I think we've not seen uh, much creativity lately. Is it possible? It's always possible. Members of Congress today are, are no less as human beings, as, as, uh, uh, as practitioners of politics than at any other time in our history. They're just as good and in some respects better because uh, the level of education is way higher than it's ever been. So personally, I have a great confidence in Congress uh, and in legislative politics. Uh, that's not a great answer, Anthony, but that's my answer. All right. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a helpful one, and we have a couple um, uh, viewer questions. I'm going to get to one that has more of a broader um, more of a broader question, then get into the second one here in a second. One um, one person asks um, during the talk, you mentioned how a crisis can make Congress stronger. In what ways did the Civil War specifically make Congress stronger as an institution? Oh, well, uh, they rose to the challenge. They rose to the challenge, and you have men uh, like Fessenden. Let's take uh, Pitt Fessenden. He was known as Pitt to everybody. Uh, a, uh, a, a conservative Yankee from Maine. You have Thaddeus Stevens, uh, a, a, a ferocious radical, also a New Englander from Vermont, actually, but he represents Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, or Ben Wade. Uh, another radical, a very passionate, intense, two-fisted kind of guy. And these men worked together. They didn't like each other, but they didn't care whether they liked each other or not. Uh, it, it, was, it became irrelevant. And personalities uh, just evaporated from considerations of doing legislation. Uh, I mean, there was a shared idea of what had to be done. And I credit the radicals primarily with being the leading edge because they were the people who saw before anyone else that the war would have to be won. It couldn't be fought with kid gloves and that slavery had, had to be brought down. They were way ahead of the uh, uh, moderates, including Lincoln on that score. Uh, but yet to take say Thaddeus Stevens, he was, he was a man of intense convictions, intense anti-slavery convictions. He was bitterly sarcastic wonderfully eloquent, but sarcastic in his uh, uh, oratory, but he was extremely pragmatic, very pragmatic. He, he would always find a way. He would always find a way to do a deal. Uh, he was persuasive, yes, but he did not, he, he, he uh, never let the perfect get in the way of the possible. And uh, I, mean, I think that's essential. And, and I, I think um, in today's uh, Congress, we both both parties both parties suffer from an overabundance of ideologues, frankly, uh, 
and 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 I personally would like to see that addressed more more forcefully by those who are not not ideologues. And our next question from one of our from one of the viewers today wants to talk about a little bit more about the allocation of war powers. I think it would surprise a lot of people who look at the executive branch today and how war and foreign policy making is made and look at it at the time of the Civil War. And reading your book, actually, I think a lot would be surprised about how deferential Lincoln actually was. And so for this question, it's, you know, in your opinion, what were the important precedents that Lincoln and this Congress at the time established concerning the allocation of war powers? Well, uh, okay, I will say that it, they argued about it for four years. They argued for four years. It was extremely contentious. It was contentious even amongst Republicans. Uh, and and uh, uh, Lincoln acted decisively in 1861. Congress was not in, in session when the war began. And he acted, he, the president he looked to was Andrew Jackson. Politically, he had nothing in common with Andrew Jackson, except that uh, he, he uh, respected Jackson's decisiveness in the 1830s in dealing with the nullification movement. And he mentions Jackson. Uh, and other radical Republicans often later in the war said, I wish there were more Jackson in Mr. Lincoln. Uh, interesting how Jackson was frequently uh, um, bandied about as, as a benchmark of decisive, as a decisive presidency. So Lincoln was in large part, other than with respect to Jackson, charting new territory by, by um, uh, uh, suspending habeas corpus without any congressional vote and so on. A lot of the argument was about habeas corpus, whether or not, uh, who could suspend it? Could Congress, only Congress could, said Congress. Only the presidency could, said Lincoln. Um, and uh, I would have to say it was negotiated and fought over step by step by step. Uh, but it should be said about Lincoln. Lincoln was, of course, a pre-war Whig, uh, which is significant here, because he uh, uh, always felt that Congress was the primary repository of the people's will, and therefore the primary center of power in the government. And he understood that the founders never intended the president to be beyond the reach of its authority. He never, ever claimed that Congress lacked the authority to challenge his actions or decline to answer legislators' requests for information. It's very interesting. And one might compare that with the last four years. Just, just on that, that uh, he never invoked presidential privilege for anything, anything. And then that's become very common, of course, in, in recent decades. Um, uh, and I think that. Uh, Ben Wade, whom I've talked about also, is significant in this regard because as chairman of the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, or, or just Joint Committee in this context, uh, Wade asserted more than any other single individual member uh, the uh, dominance of Congress in war making policy. Uh, the Joint Committee had in uh, for interviews, and in some cases, interrogation, something like 250 federal army officers in the course of the war. Imagine this in, in the present day or World War II, serving officers being, being called up to Capitol Hill and, and required to justify their tactics at the Battle of Fredericksburg or at the Anzio landings, if you want to pick a, uh, 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 something else. Uh, they, they virtually all showed up one glaring exception, William Tecumseh Sherman, who wouldn't come. Uh, but he won battles, so they, they left him alone. Uh, this was very contentious. And I, I think uh, the, our, our understanding of the presidency as the central uh, uh, nexus of, of power in the federal government really dates from the 1930s, not only. I mean, you hark back to a degree maybe to Wilson uh, it's not, doesn't purely begin with Franklin Roosevelt, but it certainly burgeons with Roosevelt 
ever after, ever after. And I think most Americans, average Americans ask today, what's the most important part of the government? They say the president. Well, 19th century, nobody, almost nobody thought that. Certainly not members of Congress. And, and I think that sort of that, that tension is fascinating. And I think the discussion of the Joint Committee um, that you talk about in the book is a really, really fascinating part of it, where, as you mentioned, you had officers who sometimes would come in and be interrogated, some junior officers there to trash their superiors. And you, know, you really had Congress in the weeds in the middle of the war. You know, I, somewhat, I mean, maybe if you're from the executive position, you would say Monday morning quarterbacking the Civil War. Um, from your perspective and your research, did you find that Congress's involvement helpful? I mean, I guess in a way it helps or encourage or force Lincoln to be more aggressive. But on the other hand, did were there instances of it maybe damaging the effort, hurting morale, or any instances maybe unforeseen by Congress? Mixed bag. Mixed bag. Um, uh, I would say parenthetically that for those listeners who may have a particular interest in the Civil War, all the reports of the Joint Committee uh, are available online through the Library of Congress. You can get them up uh, in a minute of, of Googling through the Library of Congress. And there were several copious volumes uh, published. And if you read them, these are fascinating interviews. Every major battle, at least in the Eastern theater, is discussed in detail. Uh, in real time with the officers who fought the battles or lost them, uh, uh, explaining and justifying themselves and yes, stabbing sometimes their superiors in the back. Very interesting. Uh, so I think as you just said, I agree that uh, the, the Congress, in it, primarily in the, in, in the form of the Joint Committee, did succeed in pushing Lincoln toward a hard war. And that it had to be hard. It had to be for. If you, you want a study of what was wrong, look at George McClellan, the way George McClellan carried out the war in 1861 to 62. Uh, the man was afraid to fight, and he, it seems, was afraid to win and prolong, thereby prolonged the war. Okay. This is very controversial. Other people, there are people who disagree. Um, uh, did was damage done to the actual fighting of the war. The generals in the Eastern theater, the Western theater is fairly different and it's because it's further from Washington, the generals don't come to Washington. And, and uh, federal, the federal armies were on the whole much more successful in the West than in the East. And the, by the West folks, I, of course, I mean between the Appalachians and the, and the Mississippi River west of the day. Uh, in the east, yes, generals certainly felt that Congress was looking over their shoulder. It's true. And uh, there was political jockeying uh, everywhere, but particularly in the Army of the Potomac, the great army that defended Washington. Um, and Congress, especially the radicals, and you have to lay this at their feet, pushed for uh, the promotion of officers who were more politically compatible. That is to say, who were uh, um, accepting of uh, emancipation and later of black troops, recruiting of blacks. Very controversial, by the way. Um, racism pervaded every discussion here. Uh, uh, and some of the abolitionist generals weren't very good. They just weren't. They, they didn't do very, Fremont, Fremont and the Shenandoah Valley, uh, um, being, being, a, being a notable case. Ambrose Burnside, not an abolitionist necessarily, but who led the Union Army and uh, Army of the Potomac into its worst debacle at Fredericksburg uh, in 1862, uh, was pushed by uh, uh, the radicals in Congress, as was his successor, um, Joseph Hooker, who led the army into another debacle in May of 63 at Chancellorsville. Uh, I mean, you can't lay th these failures entirely at the, at the feet of Congress because the generals, uh, th these, were, these were reasonable appointments, but they weren't very good. So one could talk a lot more about that, but it's, it's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag 
Uh, but I, I think uh, seeing how Congress uh, attempted to, and to some large degree, succeeded in guiding the war effort, which it did, um, uh, I, I think it opens up that, that question for later ages as well. And, and kind of hesitant to, to think forward, but I kind of wanted to look backward for a moment and really compare and contrast this Civil War Congress to the very first Congress that you also have written about. And I'm thinking in terms of productivity and challenge and perhaps some of the novel challenges that each Congress faced, how would you compare the two? And I think it's probably difficult to do so given the circumstances each Congress was in. But when you think of both of those, what are some of the things that uh, come to mind for you? Well, they were both uh, crisis con uh, Congresses. That's to say the founding was a moment of crisis. Uh, bear in mind that our const the constitutional system was plan B. It was not plan A. Plan A was the Articles of Confederation, which had, which had failed, mm -hmm. which had failed. Uh, and uh, when you read James Madison's letters, particularly at the beginning of the first Congress, he's in New York waiting. He doesn't know whether anybody's going to show up. It's fascinating. I mean, he, he, he was a man in ill health and uh, boy, he, he had the worst uh, indigestion in history, uh, judged by his letters. Uh, will anybody come to the party? Uh, and they trickle in, they trickle in, and it was quite a while before they even had a quorum. So first Congress, what's the crisis? To, to invent a government. The Constitution is a piece of paper. It's a plan. It's not a government the job of the first Congress was to turn these ideas, this plan, a sketch, a sketchy plan in some respects, into a functioning government with institutions, people, offices, responsibilities um, across the board. Uh, and Washington is inventing the presidency, but Congress is inventing everything else. Uh, and uh, the debates, of course, are fascinating. I mean, whether you're talking about the creation of the, the, the federal judicial system or militias or, or uh, the responsibilities actually of Congress, uh, 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 financing the government. If you've seen Hamilton, the play Hamilton, you know all about that. Uh, or if you've read Ron Chernow's book, preferably you do. Uh, but the... Uh, uh, the Civil War Congresses were not, were, I was about to say, not inventing a country, but in a sense they were, since the country that came out of the war was a different country uh, from the one that went into the war. Now, you, you have to put that together with the Reconstruction and, and the discussion over what the South was going to be after the war, absolutely. Uh, was focused on the reinvention of of, of 11 states. Uh, how Reconstruction played out is another question. I'm writing a book about that currently, actually. Uh, but uh, uh, the men of the, re the, the Civil War Congress is the Republicans. I mean, the, the Republican Party is very much the progressive party uh, in the Civil War era. The Republican Party is thinking about the future. The Republican Party uh, is the one grappling with the issues of the future. Uh, the Democrats are, by and large, other than those who essentially converted to Republicans during the war, of whom there were quite a few. Uh, but the, the, the rump end of the Democratic Party is a reactionary party. It, 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 unarguably, it's, it's reactionary. It's backward looking. Um, and is thinking not at all about the future. Uh, uh, so there's a great deal of creative thinking in the Republican Party about what the country is, what's the relationship uh, of the different parts of the federal government, C Congress and the executive primarily to each other. Um, and then what will come afterward. Uh, so in that sense, I, I, to, to reiterate something I said earlier, I think these moments of crisis really drew the best out of everybody. And if you're looking at the first Congress, it's also full of lawyers, by the way, lawyers and professional politicians, but as always. Uh, uh, but um, uh, 
the brilliant, the, the average, and the incompetent. They're all there. And, uh, uh, but the average really are drawn to the, you see them drawn to the best of their capacities by being forced to think, if we, we can't fail, we can't fail here. You read that again and again and again in their letters and in the debates. And that's also true for Civil War Congresses. Uh, uh, I don't want to use the word mediocre because it's so disparaging. But let's just say average. Men of average uh, abilities really did their best. And you find them again and again involved in war legislation of, of kind of, and debates of kind of towering, towering brilliance in cooperation with others. So there are there are significant similarities, even though it's um, a couple of generations apart. And and I think that's that's a fitting end and a fitting summary to the discussion today. And thank you um, again for our our speaker and the author of a great book, Congress at War, that talks about an important era and time for Congress. And I think some good lessons and important takeaways that we can look at throughout our country's history. So again, Fer Fergus Bordwick, thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you all who are viewing today for joining us for another Ledge Branch meeting. Um, this will be the last one, as I said, at the beginning of the hour for 2020. So we will see you in January. And until then, happy holidays, take care, and we will see you all very soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Anthony.